I'd originally planned to review the Aladdin remake, and I eventually will, because I've assembled some thoughts, but... While waiting for a reasonable period of reflection, it felt appropriate to continue discussing superhero films, but straying from the obvious focus on the MCU. This is why I'm talking about The Incredibles, my favourite superhero film. This 2004 film chronicles the lives of a superpowered couple, who, along with their children, become embroiled in the plans of a technological genius. Although this is director Brad Bird's first obvious foray into the superhero genre, excluding the Iron Giant's occasional references to Superman. Oh no. Now I'm thinking of that scene at the end. I've just ruined my own life. Incredibles complies with every important feature of the superhero story. Firstly, it invokes realistic limitations. Characters display clear vulnerability. There are occasions where Mr. Incredible experiences obvious physical pain while displaying his superhuman strength because he isn't actually Superman. No, I'm thinking of the Iron Giant again. <laughs> Give me a second. Frozone required hydration to use his powers when there was no water in the air, Elastigirl struggles occasionally with extremely strenuous stretching, Dash's costume needs to be heat proof because of his speed, etc. There's also a subtle underlying sense of general realism, explicitly detailing legal proceedings, marriage complications, social anxiety, school rebellion and job dissatisfaction in a film rife with spy film parody elements and super heroics. Thanks to the dedicated nature of the writing, these opposing forces expertly complement each other through a balancing technique that Brad Bird himself refers to as the mundane and the fantastic. Speaking of which, the Fantastic Four films should probably be renamed the Mundane Four. Led by Mr. Mundane, the mundane and fantastic theme is even sustained in the set in itself. Using an old-fashioned reality-inspired aesthetic, while borrowing elements of old, more recent, and advanced and totally fictional forms of technology, superhero films are increasingly willing to employ humanization into their stories, a concept which is on full display in The Incredibles. All primary characters are met with personal, simplistic, totally relatable obstacles that are overcome in fully satisfying, unintrusive ways, adding to the already complete feel of the plot. There are power-based obstacles too, but even these are given investable complications. In an early scene involving a plane crash, suspense is established, while Violet attempts to build a force field around her family. The audience are led to believe she'll succeed at the most opportune second, but she never does. Meaning that when she does harness her full powers later on in the film, it's all the more rewarding because of this extra layer of anticipation. Dash, meanwhile, has full control over his powers, and his character development involves learning when it's appropriate to use them, an idea that is explored much less often in superhero films. Where Jack-Jack is concerned, the idea of surprise and foreshadowing is delicately considered. In a less restrained and more pandering script, forceful dialogue would be used that would urge audiences to predict that Jack-Jack would eventually gain powers. Maybe a scene where the characters go, gee, we all have powers, Jack-Jack does not have powers, but we have powers. I hope he does get powers by the time this film ends powers. But instead, they say all of that in a deleted scene. They don't. They don't. Instead, his powerlessness is mentioned maybe once or twice in casual conversations. And the context of these conversations allow these references to seem relevant, meaning Jack-Jack's eventual gaining of powers is an undistracting surprise. The film proves that superpowered beings share traits with average people, just like all the superheroes I've defeated have. Wait, what? There's a brilliant moment at the very beginning that suggests this whole idea. Mr. Incredible is being interviewed and is struggling to put on his microphone. He points out the absurdity of the fact that he can punch down walls, but he can't put on a microphone. Because he isn't a flawless Greek god. Greek gods are really good at putting microphones on when they're being interviewed. I know that from the Greek gods book, you know the one. There's carefully based nuance in Helen and Bob's relationship, and reliance on powerless people who possess skills our superheroes simply don't. Like Edna Mode, whose impeccable tailoring and technological genius is instrumental in how heroes survive in the story. Oh yes, yeah, spoilers, they all survive. As well as this, her no capes policy proves to be extremely valuable. Every main character is given a crucial purpose, they all depend on one another. This, combined with the fact the team is comprised of a family, and 
a family friend, means it captures a united we stand, divided we fall mentality, more meaningfully than the majority of team based superhero films. Because of the emotional through line of family, characters act ruthlessly and out of extremely justified senses of desperation, a crucial feature that was made possible due to the film's embracement of mature themes. Brad Bird once stated that the film is potentially unsuitable for three to four year olds for example, but he doesn't want them seeing it anyway and they are stupid. He did not say that, uh, as far as I know. But I remember reading a possibly unreliable quote that I haven't been able to find since I am not helping my cause here. He allegedly, essentially, stated his refusal to censor his creative vision for the sake of a slightly wider audience age group wise. This was a commendable creative decision that means there are less limitations on the level of genuine threat and the weight of humour and intellect that is characterised through our villain, Syndrome, who is perfectly crafted, combining genuine comedy with legitimate menace, a sympathetic viewpoint with unsympathetic extremities, and a realistic approach to superhero tropes with a childlike sense of power. At one point he addresses supervillain's tendency to monologue, which was actually mentioned earlier on in the film, again casually, and geniusly realises it's being used as a means to defeat him, meaning his eventual defeat, much like Jack Jack and Violet's eventual full harnessing of their powers, is even more rewarding with the considered context. Syndrome is essentially a caricature of a frustrated fanboy, a brilliantly observed level of social satire made years before superhero films were the mainstream piece of entertainment they are today. One of the most satisfying elements of this film is the culmination of the whole story. Following Syndrome's defeat, Bob has relived his superheroic glory days, his relationship with Helen has become healthier, Violet has become become more socially confident, Dash has learned to moderate his powers in sport and events which mostly depend on personal gain, and once these civilian problems have been solved, a new villain emerges from the ground, therefore isolating the film's opposing themes, the mundane and the fantastic. Every potentially important detail the film introduces is brilliantly satisfied and in general The Incredibles is a stylish, entertaining semi-parody of the superhero and spy genres using the foundations of a meaningful, patient and complicated character drama as a secret identity. A detail I forgot to mention is how effectively grief is communicated, even though none of our heroes ever die, proving how artfully the creative team were able to weaponize the inevitable restrictions that working for a kids film studio would result in. Which is why the scenes that manifest genuine emotion and avoid deflating the seriousness with an unnecessary joke even though this exact tactic may be expected of a film from a children's studio, are doubly commendable. In a much shorter review I made, I rated the film a 9 out of 10, but the faults I did mention, dated animation, and a scene where Mr Incredible logically should have died, have never actually hindered my enjoyment of the film. They were only mentioned at all so that I could pretend to be slightly unbiased. So I will officially change my score to a 10 out of 10. It's incredible. Oh, I didn't even mean to make that pun. Who am I kidding? I clearly did. In the other video I made, I made the same pun, and I even pretended it was accidental then too, just shamelessly repeating ideas now. You'd swear I was Incredibles too. Ooh. Anyway, thanks for watching this video. If you have lasted this long, then you've been Superman. Oh god, Superman. I'm thinking about the Iron Giant scene again. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs>